Hello, and welcome to Communication and Behaviors to Connect and Engage with Individuals Challenged with Memory Loss, Part 1, presented by Kelly McCarthy. Overview. We're going to go over words, voice, and body, and the impact that that makes. We're going to talk about verbal and nonverbal communication. The art of listening. That's so very important. The approach and different techniques for different people. Then we're going to talk about reality orientation versus validation. And lastly, humor. So let's review communication and interaction. Communication is an exchange of ideas between and emotions between two individuals. We commonly think that the spoken word is just that, but also the unspoken word can be that too. So if I go and I'm looking at somebody and I go, it automatically shows my emotions and it shows the person that I'm communicating with, either I like them or not. Uh, you choose. So it is the root of all relationships is through uh, communicating. And it's the most important aspect when you're caring for somebody. Unfortunately, this is severely impaired when you're working with somebody with Alzheimer's or related dementias. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. So before I read my favorite quote from Maya Angelou, people with dementia have the same needs as everyone else throughout life, and that's to feel accepted, to feel love, and to feel valued by others. And if you think about what's common in those statements, it's the word feel, which brings me to Maya Angelou, because this po this um, a quote that she said wasn't directed specifically to memory loss, but it's so valuable when you're talking about memory loss because it is about the feeling. So as she said, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And this is so true with individuals with memory loss. You'll see sometimes you'll have a conversation with somebody and you make them happy and that happiness goes through the day. If they have a bad experience in the morning, sometimes you'll see that bad experience follow them throughout the day. It's not necessarily that they remember exactly what happened, but they remember the feeling. How we communicate, words, body, and voice. And I like to bring this up because it really shows the impact of not just what we say, but how we say it and also our body language. So if you look at this, 7% of a conversation gets retained, but it becomes elevated, that percentage, when it's how we say it. So if we have the inflection in our voice go high um, or that we're doing it in a way that we're uh, communicating and interacting with people, it becomes much more involved. When you use your body language so that when you're leaning in or you're walking, and so I always talk about when we're, when we're teaching a class, it's really important to stand up and walk around the room. So your body language says a lot too. It says 55% more. So if you think, if you add that all up, right, it shows 100%. So you're giving a person 100% of your communication skills when you involve how you say it what you're saying and your body language. 93% of that is nonverbal. Now there's some controversy with regarding whether or not that's the right percentage, but the bottom line is oftentimes we can see non-verbally, right, through the expression of a resident's face or our face, how we are feeling and our emotions. So it's really important to make sure that when you're asking or supporting an, so a resident to to do something, let's say, um, let's go outside for a walk. Make sure that your facial expressions say that you wanna go for a walk. It's a beautiful day outside. I'd love if you joined me, right? Versus you wanna go outside? So see the difference? It's so important to make sure we're involving all of it. And also to note that sometimes less is better with our verbal. And it's better that we use our hands our eyes, right, and to be able to express through body language. So this is one of my favorite um, explanations of emotions and feelings. 
and really supports that aspect of communication. So if you see, this is a bookshelf. On the left-hand side, you have the hippocampus. The hippocampus uh, focuses on logic, fact, and reasoning. The amygdala, which is on the opposite side, or the right side, is feelings, emotions, and memories. This is this bookshelf, particularly, is a, is a healthy brain. So it kind of depicts a healthy brain. If you look on the left-hand side, you see childhood, right? So this would be the things that you learned in childhood, logic, fact, and reasoning. So um, how to count your colors, all those primary things that we learn. Teenage years, right? So this is schooling as well. And then adulthood. So this would be uh, higher education. Uh, some people went into the military in certain, um, certain generations and cohorts. Um, a profession. Uh, middle age, so this would be that family, uh, maybe some travel, right? Old age, again, same thing, travel, time and family. And then if you look at the amygdala, this is the emotional side of it. So this would be the traditions we had as a child, right? Maybe the vacations we had. This could also be traumatic, so scary things that might have happened in our lives. And so this bookshelf uh, um, slide deck, talks about uh, when you have memory loss, how memory loss affects the brain. So this is the same bookshelf, but now early stage dementia, early stage memory loss. If you notice on the hippocampus side, logic, fact, and reasoning, there's a few books off the shelf. This is that beginning stages of memory loss, the symptoms that we see. So think about those symptoms we see. What are those first signs? So if you say repeating, you're right. So this is somebody who may repeat. And then on the right side is the amygdala. This is where the feelings are still there. The emotions are still there. No books are off the shelf, so they can still feel. And so think about someone who repeats. And so I usually use the example of what time is supper? And oftentimes people have heard that before. And then a few minutes later, after you answer them, or even seconds later, they might say, what time is supper? So multiple times they may ask that same question. And if somebody doesn't have the um, experience or education and understanding that uh, we don't correct them, uh, we don't answer them like they're saying it a hundred times, um, it can be really frustrating, right? So if you are the caregiver and you're hearing somebody constantly ask the same question over and over again, um, sometimes it gets a person frustrated. So think about this. I told you already, it's five o'clock, or it's five o'clock, or maybe, oh, silly, I told you already, it's five o'clock. If you think about all those responses, look at my face, right? You hear that inflection in my voice, and again, look at that other side where there's no books off the shelf. How does that make a person feel? And what's so important, and sometimes can be very profound for a caregiver to understand, is that even though we're hearing it many times, that person is only saying it to us once, only once. And that's when we realize that when we answer them in a frustrated tone or sarcastic or whatever it is because we've just lost our patience, that person, right, with memory loss has all their emotions intact and they're thinking they only asked it once. So really, they're thinking the problem is with you. Um, unless they have beginning stage memory loss and they, they recall that they have Alzheimer's. And this is why, and a good example, of how Alzheimer's and depression go hand in hand. Because when somebody knows they're forgetting and they're reminded constantly that they're forgetting, they can feel depressed, sad, right? So again, early stage memory loss, great example of um, the you know, beginning stages uh, and how our feelings. So the next slide is the middle stage uh, dementia. So this is where the hippocampus has lost more books, as you can see, and the amygdala has lost a couple up top. So if you look at this, um, these are books off the shelf and it's progressive, first in, last out. So you can see the childhood memories, there's still a lot there. Those teenage years, still a lot there. That's why traditions, especially songs of yesteryear or um, holiday songs, 
those things can still be a part of us, uh, remembering our vacations, um, maybe on Cape Cod um, when we were a child. Those things will stay with us longer, first and last out. So in the older age, you see a lot of the um, things that are happening every day to an individual, they may have like a 30 second memory loss uh, because they can't retain, they can't keep those short term memories. Mid stage, they've lost a few there. Adulthood, they've lost memories. Um, and so you can see up in on top, you see a little bit of the amygdala and some of the challenges that there. Let's imagine um, maybe it was a female uh, a, a resident and they they met their a love of their life, the next door neighbor boy um, in their childhood. And then teenage years, they were dating. Adult years, maybe he went off to the military and they got married. She went for her career, uh, had some children after he got back. They traveled a little bit. And now, um, you know, being 85 years old, she's living in a memory care neighborhood. Her husband died at the age of 85. So as you can tell, his book is off the shelf. Um, in old age, meaning that the death of this gentleman, right, the death of her, her husband is forgotten, but his life is remembered because they've known each other for years. Look at the amygdala side. All of the things that happened in their lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly are on that right-hand side. So the courting, the dating, the, the, uh, the wedding bells, the babies, the grandbabies, the travel, all of that's there. So the only thing that's not there is his death. And so my question is, have you ever heard a resident say, do you know where my husband is? Do you know where my husband is? Uh, I, I need my husband. And so oftentimes this is that example of the bookshelf where they forgot the memory of the person's death, but haven't forgot the person. And so now we are stuck with how do we answer this person? So if we say to them, your husband died, how's that gonna make them feel? What could happen? Now you look at that amygdala, there's a few books off the shelf, but not a lot. So this is where somebody can go, oh my God, he died, nobody told me, right? Or who the heck are you? I had breakfast with him this morning and they could be angry. So the emotions are still there, they can still feel. So it's really uh, very, you could, we have to be very careful when somebody says, Has you, have you seen my husband? Um, and that's where we work as a team to identify what could we do? And I'll give you an example. I had a resident at one of my communities, uh, I was the director at the time, and he, he looked at me and said, where's my wife? And I knew the baseline of this gentleman, and I knew that he knew his wife had died 11 years ago. And he knew that he, he was with me for about a year. One day, he just all of a sudden said, do you know where my wife is? And at that moment, thank goodness, I knew about him. I knew about his wife. And so instead of, you know, stumbling over the fact that, uh, no, she's dead, I looked at him and I said, you know what? It's 8.15. I bet you she, she just went to class. She was an elementary school teacher at a local school in the nearby, a nearby town. And so he looked at me and said, oh, okay. And he walked away. Now, I was lucky, right, that I knew a little bit about his history to be able to validate, and that's called a fiblet, by the way. It's a therapeutic lie that decreases anxiety. I didn't just forget that and move on with my day. I went right to the nurse and let the nurse know um, there's a change in condition. This gentleman now thinks that his you know, wife is alive, so let's see what's going on. So. What we did, and I'll give you a few seconds to maybe yell it out in your, if you're in a class, what would you do if somebody had a, a change in mental status like that right away? So if one of your answers were let the nurse know because there may be a urinary tract infection, right? there may be a fever, there may be something going on with this person medically, to maybe have decreased the, his baseline. And that's what you want to identify. Um, and so that's what we did. And we, know, we ended up finding out that he was negative. And this was a part of this process, his journey in, with dementia. If we looked at him and said, she's dead, can you only imagine on the amygdala, because look at his feelings, they're still intact. 
he can still feel and it can be quite a traumatic experience. So I always say work as a team. The, the answer is not always visible, as visible as it was for me that moment, but really working as a team. Um, and sometimes it might be, you know, I haven't seen her, but when I do, I'll let her know where you are. And then go back and, and work on identifying, um, you know, how we can respond to him and make sure we get the proper test because, again, it might be something that um, can be treated. So here's the last slide deck, and this is on uh, late stage memory loss. And if you can see the bookshelf on the left hand side has really um, gone downhill, a lot of books off the shelf. There's a few at the bottom, uh, but for the most part, um, logic, fact and reasoning in stage memory loss uh, is very difficult. And so if you look at the amygdala though, there's still a lot of books on the shelf. And again, this is, this is feelings, this is emotions. So imagine you're going into a residence room and it's a two o'clock in the morning and you're doing your hourly checks and you look in and you notice that their feet are on the bed and it's quiet, so you leave. Think about their feelings. This person with end stage memory loss can still feel sad. They can still feel isolated. They can still feel lonely. Now, if you go into that residence room, maybe at three o'clock because you have to do a change because they're incontinent, um, you go in there and your two people are in there, you do a check and you notice that this person needs to be changed. As you're rolling them over and you're changing them, this person can still feel what? Can you only imagine, especially let's say you're talking to each other and you're not talking to the person. They can still feel threatened. They can still feel violated they can still feel scared. Now, again, on the other side, end stage memory loss, you knock on their door and you say, hi, Kelly, it's me. And you walk into their room and you caress their hand. And before you do care, maybe you sing a little song that they used to sing to you. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. She can still feel love. She can still feel safe. She can still feel she belongs. And it's so important. I, this, this bookshelf um, exercise to me makes me understand how important it is to know that the feelings of a person, regardless where they are in the dementia experience and the dementia journey, they still feel, they can still feel. And so, um, Take that with you as you're a caregiver, um, as you, you care for all levels of this disease, it's important to understand feelings and the impact it can make. So this is definitely one of my favorite chapters in my book and it definitely relates to communication. So peacock moments, how does this peacock feel? So take a minute to think about this peacock and with the feathers wide out and spread out uh, how do you think that peacock feels? So if you said that peacock feels proud, you would be right. Uh, you look at that peacock and say, boy, that peacock looks beautiful. Yep, that's another thing that I hear a lot. And then peacocks just don't stand there, right? They'll strut. What do you need to strut? So if you say confidence, that's another correct answer. So if you think about pride, beauty, and confidence, I think about peacock moments. The reason why I share this and as it relates to memory loss is that oftentimes people with memory loss are robbed of their pride. They're robbed of their beauty and they're robbed of their confidence. And sometimes it's not intentional, but it might be our facial expressions or the tone of our voice or the action to um, something maybe that they said to us that might shoot them down. And it could be unintentional. So let me give you an example. After I shared a peacock moment and the explanation of what a peacock moment is to one of the associates, I had a, an associate say to me, hey, I created a peacock moment the other day and I asked her to, to share with me. So let's say the resident's name was Millie. She walked into the resident's room. She knocked on the door. She said, hi, Millie, how was your, how was your night? Millie looked disgusted and she's sitting on the edge of the bed and she says, it was terrible. There's a leak in my ceiling and my bed is all wet. So right away, of course, the RCA realized there's no leak on the ceiling and the ceiling, she just wet the bed again. 
But she didn't say that to her, right? Because Millie doesn't remember that she wet the bed, nor would she think that she ever did. So a peacock moment was when this RCA looked at Millie and said, I'm so sorry. Let's get Tony in here to fix that ceiling. And let's get you cleaned up. And brought the resident into the bathroom and washed her up. That's a peacock moment. It's making that person feel proud, beautiful, and confident, even if it was an, an area that for us would have caused embarrassment. And so again, it's the feeling that's so important. So when we're communicating to people, it's, it's important to maintain their pride, beauty, and confidence. A couple of things about peacock moments. Give them out as many times as you can. Practice, right? When you see somebody's hair and it looks beautiful, they just went to the hairdresser, don't just pass that person by. Did you get your hair done? That looks beautiful, right? Um, somebody in the military that's wearing a hat, proud uh, veteran, you know, say thank you for your service. And so these are those small things that sometimes we maybe forget to do when we're walking by somebody, but they are peacock moments. The other thing is don't only give as many uh, peacock moments out as you can, also receive them. So when a daughter looks at you and says, my mother loves you so much, I am so glad you are here with her. Or your, your leader, one of the leaders in the community say, hey, congratulations on Associate of the Month. You do such a great job. Or thanks for coming in when we called you last night. All of those things are moments that should create pride, beauty, and confidence in you. And sometimes I know it might be hard for you to hear um, or be, maybe feel embarrassed, but do me a favor. Say thank you. Soak it up like vitamin D. When that sun hits your skin, that you absorb that, it's only good for one day. You can't go out all week long and think that you've got enough vitamin D for the year. It's not the, the case. So when people say to you, um, thank you for what you all you do. Thank you. Say you're welcome and soak it up because it's not always easy what you do. And so again, two things, give out peacock moments and receive them. So just to recap some important things about peacock moments, oftentimes individuals with memory loss are robbed of their pride. They're robbed of their beauty and they're robbed of their confidence. And a lot of times it's because of communication and the challenges that we may face uh, when having a conversation with an individual. Our goal, right, uh, with Peacock Moments is to inspire the caregivers to self-reflect on their communication skills. Now listen, even the best intentions, we may uh, have get someone angry and upset and we don't intend to do that, but it's important to self-reflect and say, hey, did I just create a Peacock Moment? Uh, maybe I intended to, but it, it didn't work out that well. When it doesn't work out, who do you tell? Everybody. When it works, who do you tell? Everybody. We're as strong as our weakest link. And last but not least, not only do you give out as many peacock moments as possible, you also want to receive them. So here's um, a section on, again, going back to communication, verbal. So regardless of where someone is in the progression of the disease, it's important to allow uh, one question at a time. Don't overwhelm them with a lot of information. Allow them time to respond or to process. Hear that moment? It's the silence, the time for them to process the information that you're asking them. Oftentimes we want to fill that dead space, just like a radio talk show. They always want to be making noise. But with memory loss, you want to give them the time to process. Avoid disagreements. You'll never win an argument with somebody with memory loss. Avoid trite phrases or things that may sound very confusing to them. So it's time to jump in the shower. They may take that literally. It's time to jump in bed. Or it's um, looking at a bathroom and the sign says restroom. So if they don't understand, the, the name of a bathroom would be a restroom, what could they think that might be? Might be a place for them to sleep or to lay down. So again, just kind of avoiding those things that might add confusion. Apologize, this disease stinks and they're being robbed of their pride, their beauty and their confidence. So I often say when you are apologizing, it's not that you're omitting, uh, omitting guilt, it's not that you're uh, weak, 
right? This is what I hear sometimes. Oh, I've, you know, I've heard, I know people that don't like to say I'm sorry because it's a sign of weakness or I didn't do anything wrong. So why would I apologize? So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a, a housekeeper had a resident who said, you stole my jewelry. And so the um, housekeeper said, I'm sorry you feel that way. Let me get you someone who can help. Right. So she wasn't omitting. She wasn't admitting that she was guilty. She was apologizing that, hey, this is tough. I'm sorry you feel that way. And she, in fact, did get someone to support, um, you know, her after the process. So never just walk away. Have another RCA or have another person come in and say, hey, I hear that you're missing something. Um, let's let me take a little information down on that. Include the person in your conversation. So never have a conversation where it's just two people and not the resident, especially if you're in their presence. Speak to them as an adult. These people that we're caring for are the farthest thing from children as they'll ever be. So it's so important to make sure we treat them as an adult, speak to them as an adult, and include them in the conversation. Could just as be easy as if you're going on break. You've got Millie, the resident, and Jean, the RCA, and you might say, hey, Millie, I'm going on break, and Jean, you're in good hands. I'll be back in 15. Um, so again, just it, it creates that feeling of I'm home. I'm where I need to be. I'm with my people uh, versus not talking to them. we got to remember that we're in their home. Use encouragement, reassurance, and praise when you're talking with them. Again, think peacock moment, cry, pride, beauty, and confidence. So this slide just gives examples of nonverbal communication, which is very important because if you think about it, this form of interaction is related to emotions and not words. And think about the amygdala. This is a part of the disease, the part of the brain that doesn't deteriorate like the hippocampus or other parts of the brain. So utilizing gestures, right? I'm hungry or come. Um, even if you're looking at brushing your teeth and all these things can um, definitely help. Picture signs. So instead of a picture, um, a restroom or a toilet, having a picture of a toilet um, will make a, a better impact and, and oftentimes can make it more, the person more successful. Uh, facial expressions. And I know it's hard with the mask um, and hopefully someday we'll be able to um, see that. But I know I've seen people with masks and they smile with their eyes. Um, so uh, using your hands and smiling with your eyes really can help that person feel like they belong and that something's great happening and not scaring. Changing our pitch and, to and our tone of voice. Remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So if you look at somebody frustrated, because I love you, that's why. Right, versus because I love you, that's why. So making sure that that um, it reflects that feeling um, and that good feeling that we want. Because we can move mountains in a good way, but we can also move them in a bad. Demonst uh, physical demonstration of touch. And so uh, to love and be loved and to belong is so important. So whether it's a back rub you're giving to somebody, a handshake, all of these things are that form of connection. So make sure that we're doing that and making that person feel like they belong. So re responding and interacting. When you communicate with an individual, um, again, make sure that it's adult language. Honey, sweetie, or baby um, is not, it's a, it's a term of endearment, but it's not making that person feel adult-like or that they belong, that they have purpose. Uh, saying their name is so valuable. Listen, I've had my name for a long time now. So when I'm 86 years old and somebody says, Kelly, is that you? I may turn around most likely. Now, if you ask me, what's your name? I may not be able to say it. I may not be able to retain or remember to say my name. But if you say, hi, Kelly, you look great. It's gonna be familiar to me. And it's going to be a form of connection. And I'm going to feel like I'm a part of this tribe that knows me. So again, use adult language. Speak slowly and clearly. Repeat, change up words if, if as appropriate um, for them to understand. Again, you're going to give them that time to process too. 
monitor your tone. If you're getting frustrated, make sure you, you um, understand that and, and either mix things up or take a few minutes um, a break and, and you know come back. Uh, emphasize key words uh, because I love you, that's why. So all of those things are so important. Give visual cues. So again, uh, if I'm, I'm hungry, come join me. Um, utilizing your body language, your inflection in your voice, and um, in your voice, so important. So communication, responding and interacting continued. Uh, so think about you know, when you're having a conversation with someone, avoid the com competition of outside noises, radio, TV, loud voices. When I visit a neighborhood, I'm very mindful of how I uh, present at that neighborhood. If it's quiet and I'm talking to somebody, that's one thing. But if an activity is going around, I'm not going to go talking to a bunch of people that allows outside stimulation um, sidebar noises that can add to the confusion. Um, somebody may drop and lose their uh, concentration. They may get frustrated because they can't concentrate. So again, be mindful of that competing noise. If you're an RCA and a program's happening and they're singing songs with the engagement person on one side and the TV's going on on the other and nobody's in there, turn that TV off and be empowered to take control over the sidebar noises that are going around you. Provide frequent reassurance and praise. Don't argue, right, or, uh, re, um, or try to reason with the individual. Be sensitive to the fact that that person is still there and can hear you, may understand what's being said. So as a person progresses with this disease, sometimes people think, well, they can't hear me. They have, you know, their, their end stage memory loss. And so be sensitive to the fact that they, they're still there. And as we talked about with the bookshelf, they can still feel. Um, so hold their hand and have that conversation uh, because it's so meaningful to them. So as it relates to approach and communication, here's some techniques that uh, we want you to kind of uh, look at and be mindful of when you're communicating with uh, residents is a uh, visual presentation approach from the front, but kind of get off to the side and eye level. So oftentimes you'll hear people, you're, when, you're, when you're coming to someone or going to somebody, you can definitely walk up to their front, uh, right to the front of them. But I always say, you know, it might be good to get off to the side a little bit. If they cock their head towards you, that's okay. But really make sure that you have the ability to get off to the side a little bit and still give them eye contact. Because if you're in front of somebody and you get down right in front of somebody, if they are, if they don't like the smell of your perfume, if they, if maybe if you smoke and you smell like tobacco because you just went out on a break, if you go and you pin them in front, they can sometimes feel intimidated. And if somebody wants to get out of that space, the only way they have is directly through you. Versus going up to their front but getting off to the side a little bit gives them that ability that if for some reason they're scared or they don't want to be there, they can get up and walk away. Um, so that's one approach that I find very helpful. Communication, nonverbal communication. Use slow, quiet, calm approach. Take your time. Pay attention to the person's nonverbal messages. So if they're, if, if they're fidgeting around, if they're anxious, right, and you can see the frow in their uh, brow, know that they may be agitated, right? So be mindful of that. Make verbal and nonverbal messages consistent. So again, make, make sure that what's coming out of your mouth is reflective in how you speak and make sure that they're peacock moments. Make eye contact. Um, assume that the person, assume the person's feeling. So again, if they look anxious, they may be anxious. And one of the things that I, years ago, I used to hear, you know, smile, you know, smile and say hi. And so, but if somebody is upset and we're smiling and saying hi, that may not be what they want to see. So if somebody's upset, instead of smiling, I might say, I see that you're concerned. Let's talk. Right? So I'm using the same thing that they're doing. I see that you're concerned. Let's talk. And it shows them that you care. Touch frequently as appropriate and personal preferences. So again, making sure that touch is important. It's about love and be loved. It's a connection. Always ask first. If somebody doesn't like touch, then don't. 
Um, and then the other thing is personal preferences. Knowing uh, someone's uh, uh, personal preferences are so important when you're talking about approach. So if you're going to go and you're going to give somebody a shower, maybe your communication skills, if you know that they brush their teeth in the shower, is, hey, here's your toothpaste and toothbrush. The water's nice and warm versus do you want to take a shower, right? So that approach is knowing about that person's going to make, um, you know, the task and the person much more successful. So years ago, they used to bring up reality orientation. And so reality orientation for memory care doesn't work. This is when you force someone into the truth. Um, and it can definitely lead to escalating behaviors. Uh, person's internal reality was that she ate breakfast with her mother. Don't attempt to correct the person's sense of time or place uh, to reason with someone who no longer has the ability to do so. So again, if, um, if she's saying, where's my mother, or she thinks she had breakfast with her mother, um, we don't even have to validate that that's the truth. Just say, what did you eat for breakfast? What do you like? You know, what's your, fav your mom's favorite meal? So that you can still have that conversation with them. But again, don't, you know, your mother's dead. How old are you? You're 90 something. Well, how old would your mother be? They can't make that connection. They're not able to process that. So don't even try. So again, reality orientation is something we don't do. So this is on validation and really validating their emotions. So validating emotional responses. Don't assume a behavior is a part of the disease. There may be something else that's fueling that, right? So um, I want to kind of look at this slide over here and, and kind of talk about validation and, and what this is. So the fire is, let's say she hit me. So the crisis behavior is she was combative and she hit me. The, the matches are the trigger of the event. The event might be I was transferring her and getting her into the chair, right, to go into the shower. So the matches are what triggered her behavior. The fire is that she hit me. Let's go back even further than that. The fuel is the underlying problem. So the fuel might be that she has arthritis or she has pain. And so when I'm trying to get her up, I've caused the pain and she goes and she hits me. So what can we do? <clears throat> Could we give a medication, maybe some Tylenol, right? Could we talk to the doctor or the nurses there to identify what can we give this person maybe 20 minutes before a shower to alleviate some of the, the pain that she has? So I always say, you know, there's that fire and then there's the matches, but don't stop there. Go back and find out what the fuel was. What is the underlying problem? Sometimes it takes a little bit to figure that out. Praise and thanks go a long way in combating uh, injured self-esteem and feelings of helplessness. So again, uh, peacock moments always making someone feel proud, beautiful, and confident. So this is about riding the wave, joining their journey. Live in the person's world. Never question, chastise, or try to reason with a person with memory loss. Join his or her current place or time, whatever that may be, and find joy there. I know it can be very difficult. And if somebody's anxious and in a moment where they're anxious, um, that's where you sit with them and say, I see that you're upset. Let's talk. And how does that make you feel? And let them process that. You know, just like us with our friends, you know, sometimes we vent. So our residents, um, you know, that we want them to feel like they belong. So we want to give them the opportunity to share, uh, not for us to share as our associate, as associates, but for them to share. Give them that time to to be able to process through the anxiety or the challenge that they're having. Um, and you'll be surprised because after a while, they um, they might look at you and just give you a hug and say thanks for chatting. Um, when they're all done with, with talking, when they're all done with, um, you know, having, um, having a moment. And so give them that ability to be a good listener. Humor is an important um, form of treatment. Humor makes a lot of things easier. Tell a joke appropriate. Laugh often as possible. Smile. 
look at humorous pictures and movies. Use humor, but not laugh at a person. So laugh with, not at. Now, Stephanie Zeman wrote a book called Kisses for Elizabeth, and she talks about laughing appropriately in public and giving permission to laugh in private, maintaining the respect and the dignity of the person you're caring for. Now, this is a part of a caregiver's oath that I, may, I wrote in my book. So laugh appropriately in public, but giving yourself permission to laugh in private, maintaining the dignity and the respect of the person you're caring for. Sometimes our residents say funny things and they don't think it's funny. And as long as they're safe and you put it in a light that you are, your first objective is to make sure that person is safe. Sometimes what they say is funny. And if you go into a, you know, the, the, a private space and giggle about it, it's okay but always do it with the utmost respect. It's, you're not going to be doing it maliciously. Um, you do it respectfully. And so I'll give you an example. I had a resident who um, was very serious and I looked at her, I said, you have the most beautiful eyes. And she said, I wouldn't know. I stand behind them. And she wasn't laughing at all. And I, I said, that's profound. That's wonderful. And I went back into my room and I giggled about it because I thought it was such a wonderful thing to say. How profound. Um, and so I, I use that quite a bit and think it's a great thing. So again, use humor. Never laugh at, laugh with, right? And then have those times, those private times where if something's funny, uh, respectfully maintaining their dignity, you can laugh. So this section's on listening. And this is so important. I, I remember a philosopher I used in my book said, we have two ears and one mouth so that we should listen twice as much as we speak. So be patient and supportive of the person. Let him or her know that you're listening and that you're, interest, uh, you're interested in what they're saying. That is so important. It makes a person feel like they belong and they're being heard. Your interest conveys respect, which is so important, and concern. Allow time for what is being said to process. Don't interrupt. Offer guesses about what they're trying to say. Um, and oftentimes, just joining their emotional journey when they're, con when they're having a conversation with you is all that you need. So you may not understand the topic that they're saying they, if they have aphasia and they have a, a difficult time formulating language, but if they're happy while they're talking with you, you can maintain a conversation with them being happy too. Um, and they'll feel very content that they're being heard. Um, and again, depending on their cognitive level, if they're um, a little challenged with being able to process, maybe rephrase in a yes or no as their pain um, and things like that. So kind of simplifying if you need to as the disease progresses. So listening continued. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about listening to speech or rambling. Even if it doesn't make sense, you may hear something. Um, I had a resident once look at me and she was saying the boy and he was under and under and under and up, 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 up and bye, bye, woo, and, the, and, the, and it was in the window and oh, and it was, and, and so as I was watching her, I was hearing this rambling on, but I noticed her physical was telling me she was cold because she was rubbing herself. Um, so again, looking for nonverbal cues to help us understand is that also that form of listening. Remember that a person with Alzheimer's disease or related dementias, communication sometimes is like being in a foreign language and not understanding it. So be very mindful that as you communicate, less is better and make sure that you use not only your voice, the inflection in your voice and your body language to convey you care. Communication, speech, and language challenges vary from person to person and may vary day to day or even moment to moment. Thank you. This concludes our presentation on communication, part one.